Ellen 24-7 is first of all a new station. We will continue with updates from the just concluded governorship in the southeast has raised questions if INEC will be able to conduct Southern elections. With a whole team of over 40 correspondents spread across the nation. Nigeria is set to take its place. The unions of aviation workers are out here protesting and affiliates in Africa, Europe, America and Asia. We give you news as it breaks from the perspective you can trust. Ellen 24-7 News. Where the story goes, we go. Is France a freak? The OPAC independence deal that supplied Africa's resources to France being dismantled one coup at a time as interests clash within ECOWAS. And is the Gabon coup a smokescreen for Ali Bongo's exit while the Bongo family retains power? Welcome to the agenda as we once again set our sights on what's happening on the African scene as we seek to prefer pro-life and pro-African solutions to the challenges bedeviling the continent. My name is Henry Williams. Welcome to the program. Our talking points today will be revolving around uh, Niger versus France standoff. We'll also be looking at uh, the coup pattern, AU ECOWAS response and action. And finally, we'll also delve into the true meaning and relativity of democracy. And my guest will be none other than Karanja Gashusha, African affairs analyst, wealth of experience in geopolitics and African affairs. Also be having Onyekachi Adekoya, security analyst, expert on political economy and security when it comes to Africa. So we'll be talking, there's no way we can talk about what's Af talking or happening right now without delving into the security aspects. I want to welcome my guest. Thank you, uh, Karanja, for joining us on the agenda. It's great to have you. Thank you, uh, Henry, for having me. I appreciate um, being on the show again. Well, good to see you without your glasses, Karanja. I guess you've added a little bit of weight. But talking about weight, there are weightier matters to discuss today on the African scene. As we start in Niger, thousands of people rallied in the capital, uh, Niamey, demanding that France withdraw its ambassador and troops from the West African country as its new military rulers have accused former uh, colonial power, France, of interference. Now, the protesters gathered near the military base housing uh, French soldiers after a call by several civic organizations hostile to the French military presence. And they held up the banners proclaiming French army leave our country. And Niger's military government, which seized power on the, uh, July the 26th, has accused French President Emmanuel Macron of using divisive rhetoric in his comments about the coup and seeking to impose neo-colonial relationship with its former colony. Let's take a listen. The people of Niger have come out regardless of any differences they may have. For one thing, to show that their nation is effectively sovereign. And we are here at the cost of our lives because this constant and permanent gathering will continue until the French occupation forces leave Niger. Yesterday the resistance continued. Today, as you can see, it continues. And it will continue tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. It will continue forever until those morons leave. Because they are at the Niger military base. The media lie and say it's a French base, but it's not. It's a base of Niger. They are here illegally. All right, and there are some reactions coming from Niger there. Many analysts have waded into what's happening in Niger and other parts of Western Africa as a new wave, a revolt against Western or colonial, um, colonial inference, or the, um, the traditional word, the France Afrique, 
relationship. Let me ask you, Gashusha, what are your thoughts on what is happening in Niger? Um, what, how do you define that, uh, the situation on ground? Many have called it a coup, but after speaking with so many Africans on the continent, they have a different perspective. You know, if there's any, any kind of an overthrow, the overthrow, I would argue, is, um, by the way, I'm getting an echo. I don't know if it's coming through in the video. Uh, if it's not, that's fine. I can just keep going. Um, so I'll keep going and hopefully, uh, okay, yeah, I don't hear it anymore. Thank you. Um, yes, so of course, what is the overthrow, if there is an overthrow, is an overthrow of a corrupt colonial system of quote-unquote so-called democracy, which is anything but democratic. Democracy is supposed to deliver not just government for the people by the people, or if you're going to call it government for the people by the people, then you have to define exactly what that means. That has to include prosperity, it has to include peace, it has to include um, good health, good education, nutrition, food sovereignty. And uh, what we see is that the post-colonial, uh, so-called post-colonial, we are really not in a post-anything uh, situation. We're not in a neo-colonial, we're not in a post-colonial, we are really actually still colonized. And uh, if these dispensations, if this uh, governmental dispensations or, or, or uh, systems of government have not delivered those things, have not delivered health, education, prosperity to the people, then these governments cannot be governments of the people by the people. These governments that we inherited from the colonizer, that the colonizer has keeps uh, reinforcing by force with military guns and weapons, these systems are anything but democratic for uh, African, for the African populations. And this is not just in Niger, by the way. It, 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 it so happens that in Niger, the, the people are awake to it, uh, as well as in Burkina Faso, Mali, and, and Guinea. However, uh, these systems actually are in existence everywhere across the continent uh, from uh, all the way west of from Sierra Leone all the way to Cape Town uh, and, and east all the way to Kenya and, and Gabon. Uh, sorry, I don't know why I said Gabon, but Gabon is one of the countries, obviously. I, I meant uh, Djibouti. Um, so these systems are not democratic. They're not democracy. So we've inherited systems that ensure that the wealth of Africa, the natural resources, the human resources, the agricultural resources, uh, the water resources, the, the energy resources, everything is controlled, continues to be controlled by the colonizer. So we've not, we, we, we have never acquired uh, liber liberation. We have never acquired independence. We have never left colonization. It is not yet Uhuru. And so what is happening in Niger is that the people have decided that they want to overthrow this system, remove it, and replace it with a new system that actually works for the people. So. It, arguably, these coups of the removal of corrupt systems, and by the way, I'm, when I'm re referring to corrupt systems, I'm not talking about Bazoom or the, uh, uh, you know, or, or any other African leader for that matter. I'm talking about the colonial, the colonial dispensations that have been left to us. So yes, these, these, you can call them coups. They are coups removing corrupt systems, replacing those corrupt systems with governments for the people by the people that are representative of the wishes of the Nigerian people. Uh, Echo was the, the regional bloc has tried to wade into this, uh, trying to restore democratic rule in Niger. Uh, but some have faulted Echo as saying, we're going to look at democracy. You must and uh, call Niger cool. You must begin to start with the way elections are conducted on the continent. A lot of democratic coups have taken place where elections are rigged and somewhat of a power grab. And the, the leadership see, see, has a semblance of democracy, but in expedition, in, in uh, execution, in, it's more of autocratic and more of a, uh, uh, you know, a forceful leadership, if, if I put it that way. What are your thoughts? Do you agree with this perspective? 
Of course, uh, there's no democracy without representation of the people. Elections are not democracy. Uh, going to the ballot, even term limits in and of themselves, and, and elections and voting are not democracy. Democracy, like I said, as I, uh, as I defined it, and by the way, this is not my definition. The definition of democracy is government for the people by the people. It, democracy the, the, the very definition of democracy is supposed to be representation. Uh, I have described this before uh, on this very show. I talk about it in almost every uh, instance, every opportunity that I get to describe the Western systems of so-called quote-unquote democracy that they are trying to push onto us that are anything but representative. Even in the West, they do not represent the people. Uh, I point out the American system, for example, where the Electoral College is not democratic, the, their Senate is not democratic, their Supreme Court is definitely not democratic because it's not representative of the people. It's an openly partisan Supreme Court. And their Congress is also not democratic because it is so gerrymandered that it cannot represent the people. So, and, and of course, we see in the United Kingdom, they have a monarchy with one family ruling for the, uh, over a thousand years. And then we have a, a parliamentary system where you can have a hundred uh, MPs overthrow uh, the previously elected um, Liz Trust, for example, in the case of the current uh, dispensation that they have in the United Kingdom. These are the systems that they exported to us and they enforce on us in Africa specifically by the barrel of a gun. They are not uh, trying or attempting to reinforce these systems, the term limits, the, 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 the compulsory term limits, the, the, um, uh, the, the systems that, uh, that, that require voting, they're not attempting to reinforce them in, in the Middle East. Uh, Netanyahu has been uh, prime minister for, I think, you know, 15 uh, plus years, and he's ran God knows for how long, over 20 years, right? Uh, that's one, one instance in the Middle East. The, the rest of the Middle East has monarchies. They're not trying to reinforce voting there. So what is the difference? Why? And I think what the difference is, I'm, I'm beginning to, it's beginning to become very clear that the reason that uh, these Western colonizers are so adamant that we must pursue these systems that they force onto us, these systems of term limits and, 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 and voting as the panacea of, to, to democracy is because they are able to control this system. They are able to use international accords and international organizations like the IMF and the World Bank and um, the United Nations as well to uh, suggest that somehow we have a say because we went to the ballot. Whereas in reality, what happens is that corporations, Western corporations, French, uh, Canadian, American, British, uh, Italian, German, all of these people, by the way, are in Africa. Uh, these are the people that run our, uh, our, our uh, systems of government. These corporations, they're the ones that own all our resources, both human and natural. And um, so essentially, our leaders have become um, such that uh, the, their constituents are these Western corporations. So I, I'm not even, I, I don't even care about going into the details about, for example, the, the likes of Paul Bia or, or Ali Bongo that was just ousted in, in, in Gabon. It's irrelevant because it doesn't even matter whether these people who've ruled for 40 years are there or whether we have a system like Kenya, which has an extremely transparent election. President William Ruto is still not in a position to do what he needs to do for the Kenyan people, despite us uh, following all the dictates that we have been forced uh, that have been um, uh, forced onto us by the Americans, by 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 the Westerners, um, Kenya. Uh, the president of Kenya still isn't able to represent the people of Kenya because primarily his number one constituent by force has to be the IMF, the World Bank, and British Petroleum, Shell, the likes of Shell, Monsanto, uh, Bayer Crop Science. These are the constituents of our leaders. So it doesn't even matter. The only place that I can say that there is liberty and independence right now are places like in, uh, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, where they, have, they are ridding themselves of the colonizer, uh, Eritrea, and um, Zimbabwe. The rest of us are still under the thumb of colonialism.
How do we really know that this is what is happening in the sense that we find out that many times, even as children growing up in Africa, you, we've witnessed one, one or two coups in our time. And each time the military makes that incursion and to, to truncate the democratic process, there is jubilation, there is, there is this excitement because the people have been oppressed, they've been denied their rights, their social amenities living in squalor and, and lack in the midst of uh, of uh, you know uh, of so many resources so much um, wealth that they have no access to how do we know that this is what you say it is uh, that it is a revolt um, it is a turning point uh, a new dawn for africa well we, are, we, we of course it's still very early to tell but all signs coming from Burkina Faso from Mali and now from Niger are that first and foremost the populations in the French-speaking West African countries including the other uh, 10 uh, or so uh, plus uh, where um, these revolutions aren't taking place that what we have seen is that the citizenry the populations in these countries are fed up we just saw over there the video of the people in Niamey saying that the French have to leave I've never seen that anywhere else I've never seen that in East Africa I've never seen that in Kenya we have British bases we have a, a American bases um, and the French are making incursions by the way into Kenya Nigeria and South Africa I've never seen that in any other place except the French speaking countries where they are demanding the departure of the colonizer who has remained in place uh, in various ways through economics primarily but in the case of every single West Af uh, French former French colony in West Africa as well that they've had french bases as well they've had troops as well in the case of the english-speaking countries i think kenya is one of the few um there's of course djibouti which is not i, I don't uh, actually know i think they're french speaking um they were formerly colonized by by france but i think the british also made incursions into there uh, in the case of djibouti there are bases of every single power uh, uh into, you know big power out there including china by the way as well as western powers so these bases in a number of countries for sure in kenya um as well as uh, of course africom has bases all across africa uh, these are american bases so these are not french bases so we need to be clear about the fact that these incursions by the West into our continent exist across the continent the difference is that in Niger the people are awake and they are demanding the departure of, of the colonizer they are demanding and and they came together the the, the 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 people there that we saw in the video they are very eloquent about the fact that they are putting aside their differences their internal uh, petty um, partisan differences because we all have them in all our countries and until we copy uh, what we see happening in Niger and unite behind this one idea of getting rid of the colonizer <coughs> excuse me uh, until we unite behind that idea, we, uh, the rest of us, uh, we, when we do that, we will be able to also rid ourselves of, of the imperialists. Until we do that, uh, we will continue to be um, colonized. Our economies are going to be continue are going to continue to be dominated by Westerners, by outsiders. All right, I'm going to allow um, Garanja to take that glass of water uh, while we look at you know while we're still discussing um, what's happening uh, in the West African region. Uh, the coup in Niger, starting with the coup in Niger. Uh, the, the, the process, um, the, the engagements have begun with the regional body ECOWAS trying to restore you know, democratic uh, dispensation in that country. Um, but yeah, there has been a pushback. Um, the military appointed Prime Minister Ali Mahmane Zaina said uh, he sees hopes of a deal with West African uh, bloc ECOWAS which has uh, threatened to use force to restore civilian rule after the coup in uh, July. Our key question in the crisis is a timeline of returning to civilian rule. That's one of the pointers. Uh, when will they return power to civilian rule? Uh, Niger, uh, Nigerian President Bola Tinubu, who is also the current chairman of ECOWAS, suggested a nine-month period such as uh, his country underwent 
in the late 1990s. Let's take a listen from the Prime Minister uh, appointed in Niger, Ali Mahmani Zain. We have received delegations on four occasions. We ourselves have made a visit and we are confident that in a few days we will be able to reach an agreement very quickly so that all these measures can be lifted. As a responsible government, we expect the country to come under attack at any time, which is a pity. All the necessary measures have been taken so that we can defend ourselves. You should know that. And I mean every measure, because that would be an unjust war. All right, uh, there the appointed uh, Prime Minister Ali Mahmane says they expect an attack uh, by ECOWAS at any time. They are battle ready. Sadly, the key issue is, uh, is um, what is the timeline for returning Niger back to democratic rule. Um, the, the democracy itself, there's a big question around that. Uh, uh, Karanja, uh, we, have we, are we supposed to interrogate that question? Are we practicing the right kind of democracy for Africa? We've talked about democracy in other climes. They've been organically de developed. They've developed it according to their personal experiences. Uh, we, have we taken something hook, line, and sinker, copy and paste it, and it's not working for us right now? Uh, absolutely. What we have done is uh, garbage in, garbage out. We have copy-pasted garbage, and what we are getting is garbage. Uh, what is the timeline for a return to democracy in Nigeria? Because as far as I can tell, in Nigeria, I'm very clear I'm talking about Nigeria, not Niger. What is the timeline for the return to democracy in Nigeria? Because I do not believe that there is democracy in Nigeria when uh, the leader, the president there, has been elected by 9 million people in a country of 220 uh, and 20 plus million people. So what is the timeline for democracy? What is the timeline for returning Nigeria to a situation where Shell, Chevron, ExxonMobil, uh, Total do not own the resources of Nigeria. What is that timeline? So why are we demanding a timeline for a people that are actually fighting for uh, their, uh, their rights? What is the timeline for independence? What is the timeline for freedom? What is the timeline for liberation? It will take as long as it needs to take for them to liberate themselves, for them to sit down together. This is a question for the people of Niger about what kind of system of government they want. So while we are discussing timelines, what is the timeline for a return to democracy after the recent uh, overthrow of the government uh, going back to the exact same system in Gabon? What is the timeline, uh, I ask, for a return to democracy in my own country, Kenya, where the resources of Kenya, where the tea plantations that are owned by the British no longer are owned by the British, where the British abuse Kenyan workers. Um, what is that timeline for returning our tea farms to Kenyans? What is the timeline for returning the mines that Australian uh, miners, uh, companies are mining at the coast of Kenya? What is the timeline for starting to share with us or, or rather, what is the timeline for them leaving, actually? That's what they need to do. And while they are there, what is the timeline for them changing the 95% uh, 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 to 5% distribution of the wealth of the, res of, of, of the mines in Kenya? People are not aware that these things are, are happening also in, uh, in English-speaking countries. They think that it is only um, that the abuses of Western corporations, that the, that the massive uh, take, the massive uh, percentages that they take only happen in French-speaking countries, that is not the case. What is the timeline for the return of land to the rightful owners in South Africa? Indeed, Karanja, you've asked a million-dollar question or questions there, uh, what the timeline is if Nigeria, uh, uh, Nigerian voters, out of 200 million voters, only about 9 million plus went to the ballots. Uh, you've asked very salient questions here that um, really need answers. Also, we, I'll be posing this question to you about the role of ECOWAS over the years. What has it really done in terms of protecting 
those within uh, under its umbrella from France, uh, French domination, French control, and Western imperialism. We'll take a quick break and take this message. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Well, it's great to have you back. You're still watching The Agenda on LN247. And we've been discussing regional politics and the threat of instability and also the unity of Africa in all this mix. Um, the pointers we've been looking at, um, the talking points on the show have been uh, Niger, Niger's experience, uh, recent developments in Niger, Niger versus the France standoff um, how do we resolve this? Where is it going to end? Um, the, the coup pattern, um, the African Union ECOWAS response and its action against this. And finally, the true meaning and relativity of democracy. And now my guest is uh, Karanja Gashusha, who is joining us from Washington, D.C. in the United States. Um, he is versed in geopolitics and African affairs. So Karanja, it's really great to have you as we've been discussing quite a bit, been talking quite a bit on what's happening uh, in Niger. And the question I was about to pose to you before we went for that break was, you know, um, people don't care how much, um, they don't care uh, how much you know, how much power you have until they know how much you care. I mean, the role of ECOWAS over the years in protecting its territory, has it been effective? Has it played that role? We know that there has been some bilateral relationships with this, you know, with this uh, members. But have we really, really done enough to protect ourselves from the, uh, the, um, the, uh, um, uh, um, Western imperialism over over the years, considering the fact that France still extorts this nation's the economy is at the lowest ebb. Niger remains poverty stricken, one of the poorest nations in the world, despite lighting up France 
and living in darkness. Um, um, looking at the role ECOWAS could have played, probably some have said the ECHO, which was supposed to be the, uh, the, uh, the currency that it was supposed to be rolled out to checkmate the, um, the French franc that France was using for its francophone, its um, former, te former territories. What, what's your take on that? Well, it, it's very clear that ECOWAS' uh, number one uh, constituent is Emmanuel Macron because ECOWAS is right now representing the wishes of Emmanuel Macron and France. So um, we need to call it what it is uh, because it's clearly not uh, the economic uh, uh, cooperation of West African states. It's economic cooperation for France and uh, Tinubu. Um, and, and whoever is at the head of it, uh, they're currently, I mean, there has been, uh, you, as, you, as you rightly state, the echo was supposed to be the currency that should have been the currency of the African state, uh, of, the, uh, of the 14, uh, of all the countries of ECOWAS, but all, which of course includes all the, the uh, 14 or 15 uh, French, um, former French colonies that continue to use the franc CFA, which is a, an, an, a, a, a I don't know how else to describe it other than an ens uh, the enslaver's currency. Uh, it is a currency that does not allow any independence, but further uh, for those countries, but furthermore, these countries deposit all of their treasury deposits. Let that sink in. And I know it's been said very often, especially by, uh, it, it, was, it was highlighted by Her Excellency Dr. Arikana Chihombori Kwa very eloquently uh, the last few years. But they deposit uh, the majority of their uh, treasury deposits in the, in the Bank of France, in the National Bank of France. What kind of craziness is that? Where has ECOWAS been in raising outrage over that? Where has out ECOWAS been when people in, across the Sahel uh, in the West African countries that it is supposed to represent are being killed by terrorists? When the French and the American troops show up in these countries and that not only does terrorism not reduce, in fact, it has increased. Um, in, at the same time as these bases have increased. And I'm not uh, suggesting, I'm not saying that uh, the two correspond, but uh, the coincidence is uncanny that with the entry to French, with, or, or French troops and American troops, terrorism increases. With their departure, as we see in Mali and Burkina Faso, terrorism has reduced. So you draw your own conclusions i don't know what i don't know i don't know what that means but it, it is worth investigating it's the, it's the same way by the way in east africa so ecowas has not been representing the people of west africa ecowas uh, allowed so insane ecowas allowed the people of mali to go without food medication and electricity these are things that are excluded in sanctions. You, it is illegal to deny food, medication, and electricity to any population. Mothers have been dying and their babies have been dying in delivery wards in Niger because of the cut of electricity by ECOWAS. So ECOWAS is clearly not even attempting to, to pretend to represent the people of West Africa. It is clearly representing the interests of Shell, Chevron, um, Orano, the, uh, the, the big company that mines uh, uranium in, in Niger, um, and, and the other big multinational corporations. It is not a representative of the people. They have not displayed, as you rightly say, show me who you are and I'll tell you, you know, show me what you do and I'll tell you who you are. Uh, what ECOWAS, by actions, ECOWAS has shown that it is not even interested in pretending to attempt to represent the people of West Africa. So it is, it is, it is a null and void organization. By the way, they were going up against the African Union. The African Union said that uh, there should be no military incursion into Niger, and yet ECOWAS was defying that. So is ECOWAS, are the countries of ECOWAS part of the African Union or not? Because it's so schizophrenic and, con and confusing how a, a, an entity that is part of the African Union can uh, rise up and, and, and pursue 
Emmanuel Macron's personal interest over the interests of the of the constituents that it's supposed to represent. It, 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 it's it's unbelievable. It's it's just uh, insane. We need to rethink these organizations uh, or, or scrap them all together if they are not going to be representative. Think perspective you're bringing. Some might say drastic. But uh, they say drastic situations might need drastic measures. But let's uh, look at the, the you know, incidents map of all these schools that have happened since 2020. Uh, a turbulent continent of Africa has experienced an eight schools, um, eight schools since August 2020 after army officers in Gabon deposed um, President Ali Bongo Odimba. And looking at the map uh, right now, if you can have that map up, if the, the map shows Mali, Guinea, Burkina Faso, Niger, Gabon, twice in Chad. Um, gladly, we have our guest finally here. Onyeka Chiodikoya is here with us. Great to have you. Your experience in security, sir, would be very, very invaluable to help us make a sense out of these things. We've talked about connecting the dots. Um, what are your thoughts? What do you see from a security perspective? Is there anything that um, the ordinary eye cannot see in this is incidents is happening? Is there something common between all these nations? Yeah, I think um, we're back to the issue of governance. And um, again, I listened to former President Olusegun Basunjo, who then said um, that perhaps maybe Africa should take a second look at its um, new um, liberal democratic stance. Mm. Uh, we must go back to this whole history of um, liberal democracy and how the world came about a catchphrase. Um, before 1991, what we had was a bipolar world, okay. uh, which um, came as a fallout of the Second World War, um, after the Allied Party succeeded in defeating Nazism. And just immediately after that, um, this geopolitical competition ensued between the U.S. Um, mapping out the Western Bloc and then long and short, uh, the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991. The world shifted from a bipolar scenario and even Africa had to adjust its foreign policy to taking a non-alignment um, stance mm. to say that we will not get involved in anybody the other person's business other than what serves the African Union's interest. Now, well, what, was, um, that was um, acceptable. If, if at at the time, it was a very smart position to take. Now, so fast forward, post-1991, um, we now had a unipolar world characterized by a liberal democracy. And so democracy went on tour, as we see. And uh, there's been several wars. If you ask me what's the security connection, we're back to it. There have been several wars since 1991 up till this date. And um, that's again at the back of some of the other issues. You listen to, uh, um, I need to remember his name now, one of the Bolton, John Bolton, who okay. said that at the time on CNN that the US was also responsible for several coups, even in Africa. Uh, so if you count in recent coups, you must also look back at the history and the checkered histories we've had with colonialism, um, the indirect rule system, the mapping of the continent, and then the creation of international borders. Um, there are a lot of um, conflicts going on. And um, these conflicts are underlining factors that drives maybe like a crisis in the DRC Congo, Congo. in Sudan, um, in Niger. Of course, you know that the case of Niger is a case of uh, the Hausa majority being ruled by mm -hmm. a Bagrab Arab minority. And I mean, Nigeria connotates with uh, Niger, but we, we have a more or less a borderless relationship. So, absolutely. So, I mean, you could look at the case, and I hear the other, my colleague on the other yeah. side talking about the uselessness of uh, ECOWAS and ECOWAS wanting to be like um, a front. For but, Macron. Uh, I think that's going to be too far. Big, big, we okay. must dimension the issues properly. Okay. I think there are historical problems okay. that has led us to this point. Uh, sorry to cut you. I was trying to that just... That have uh, shackled ECOWAS from being a, as effective as it should in protecting its, its territory from incursion, from um, imperial, you know, influence? 
Life is uh, rather funny sometimes. You look at the U.S. relationship with Japan. Um, the U.S. dropped a nuclear bomb on um, Hiroshima and I think um, this other side, Nagasaki. Nag Nagasaki. And um, there were sworn enemies at the, at the point. Now they are best of friends. Look at the ECOWAS. ECOWAS had a fighting force called ECOMOG. ECOMOG was considered a threat to foreign influence operators and their interests in West Africa. ECOMOG was systemically dismembered and dismantled. Fast forward to where we are, there's a claim now that ECOWAS and ECOMOG are now in bed with the same people mm. that have put them in a state so, of so, quagmire. quagmire. So, Homer, if you ask me. Yeah, so it's uh, rather funny and dramatic. So I, I hear my colleague on the other side. I, yeah, I'm a student of history, and I always think about context, everything about context. Uh, I think it's rather simplistic to assume that, oh, let's, let's just weave ECOWAS off and say ECOWAS is completely useless. Um, on the part of the African Union, with profound respect, I think they've been rather disrespectful and uncharitable to ECOWAS. There's even in international diplomacy, there's a protocol. It's the region first, and when the region cannot handle, then the AU comes in. But, but there are a number of issues between South Africa and the AU and some of the international policies. Just, going on. just when I'm, I'm getting, you know, we're getting into this discussion, we're told that our time is fast spent. But I want to get, glean a lot, a glean, you know, a, a lot from you because you just, just, just joining discussion at um, Onyekachi. If I, your last word now, right now, ECOWAS, uh, it doesn't look like there's a, going to be any military incursion from ECOWAS. Well, I hope that there isn't going to be. Uh, but right now, what, sh what do you see security-wise in terms of actions that ECOWAS will have to take to, uh, to restore um, um, and, you know, democ democratic dispensation in Niger, especially when a timeline is yet to be achieved? No, it's good to see that the parties are, are already, op they've opened up um, diplomatic channels. Um, the um, skies over Niger has been opened up now to international travel. Conversations are going up. They have a civilian prime minister. Without the threat of military invasion, I don't think that um, some of the concessions, sometimes in international diplomacy, you must put the big stick on the table and then explore those other conversations. And, and just to say um, that the Nigerian president doesn't necessarily need the approval of the Senate to invade Niger. That point must be made sufficiently. Um, ECOWAS his, doesn't need the AU as well? No, ECOWAS doesn't need the AU. What is the AU? Where has the AU been in all the issues concerning Africa? What is the AU? AU was recently remodeled. It was Organization of African Union or whatever it was now rework to AU. The ideals of the AUs are not even being pursued. Gaddafi is no longer there. Uh, you know, some funny characters, interesting characters. What is the AU today as it were? Um, you know, so if, if you take out Nigeria, the most populous black country anywhere in the world, out of AU, what do you have? So um, some, some breach of protocol, I think, on the part of AU. I think we have to visit that discussion on Yekachi and uh, I would certainly hope that you are available to do that because what is the role of AU, what role has it played over the years as it slipped into a coma and state of suspended animation? Well, um, as, we, as we close, I'd like um, uh, Garanja to say his final words. Garanja, can you take us home before we say our goodbyes? Hello, Mr. Gajkush. Uh, okay. Yes, I hear you. Um, so first of all, the United States has no friends. The United States has only interests. And with the relationship with the United States and Japan, the United States knocked the Japanese economy off the world map in the 1990s when, the, when Japan was rising and was on the brink of becoming the number one economy in the world. Uh, the United States forced Japan into uh, agreements. By the way, Japan is still occupied by the United States till today. They forced them into agreements that essentially reversed the Japanese uh, economy's uh, growth. And right now, by the way, you have 17 million 
unemployed Japanese people in their 30s and 40s living with their parents because the economy in Japan is not able to provide jobs for these people. So, you know, uh, facts do matter, you know, or, or you can you, you can just issue uh, statements that uh, you don't expect to be challenged. I didn't hear what uh, ECOWAS has done for the people of West Africa that deserves uh, that, that deserves um, uh, raising up ECOWAS as a body that is doing something. Uh, as far as we can tell, ECOWAS, as far as I can tell, I don't see what ECOWAS is doing for the people of West Africa. And it clearly has no business allowing people to die in Niger, allowing women, mothers, uh, uh, expectant mothers to die and babies to die at the delivery room. I do not know what uh, negotiations ECOWAS is undertaking in, um, in Niger. Uh, on behalf of of whom the people of Niger have made their choice clear. Why is ECOWAS not making similar incursions into Gabon? Why is ECOWAS not making similar incursions into Guinea? Um, so there's an inconsistency. All but right. the one consistency that we see is that they are representative of Macron's interests. All right. Thank you so much, um, Garu uh, Gakusha, for you know your submission there. That's where the sun sets on today's edition of the program. Wanted thank you gentlemen for for joining in and all your thoughts thank you uh onyekachi it's been great having you um, um i hope we'll get you earlier next time around and uh, garanja thank you for your thoughts great having you i hope you have a fantastic day and where we will leave this discussion we're still looking at africa what will the au be doing what has the au been doing maybe that will be our next port of call looking at the au should we be re re refurnishing or re <laughs> or reworking the au to actually do what it was designed to do well that's the way the show has been on today's edition thank you for staying with us on ln 24 7 you've been watching the agenda and as i always say only Africans can build Africa. My name is Henry Williams. See you same time. Bye bye. Ellen 24 7 is first of all a news station. Well, we'll continue with updates from the just concluded governorship in, in the southeast has raised questions if INEC will be able to conduct South elections. With a whole team of over 40 correspondents spread across the Nigeria. Nigeria is set to take its place. Millions of aviation workers are out here protesting and affiliates in Africa, Europe, America and Asia. We give you news as it breaks from the perspective you can trust. Ellen 24-7 News. Where the story goes, we go.